Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, everybody to the show. Um, this is the uh, first one that we've run as a transatlantic show, which is really exciting. So let's, let's start off with a picture, a story. And the story is actually quite interesting because one day a young Buddhist on his journey home came to the banks of a wide river. And he was, what shall I say, staring hopelessly at this great obstacle in front of him. And he pondered for hours on how is he going to cross such a wide barrier? <coughs> and just as that he was about to give up, he saw a great teacher on the other side of the river. And the young Buddhist said, yelled over to the teacher, oh, wise one, can you tell me how to get to the other side of the river? And the teacher ponders for a moment, looks up and down the river, and he yells back, my son, you are on the other side. So what we're trying to do with this transatlantic show, it's the same audience that you would expect, so the leadership and management of professional services firms. That's law, accountancy, property consultancy. We're trying to look at the areas of similarity and the areas of difference. And we want to help people that seek new ideas, but also a better understanding of those on the other side. Now we're positioning it as neither North America nor Europe. And my sort of picture is think of, think of the panel, we'll introduce them in a minute, as a panel of experts on a boat and they're in the mid-Atlantic and there's a lot of winter swell. And what they're trying to do is to avoid the cultural icebergs which are coming at them from all directions. So who are my panel today? Um, firstly, I would like to welcome Sebastian Hartman. And Sebastian is the global head of technology at strategy at KPMG. And he is talking about the impact of technology on defining the optimal contribution of leadership and management to the business. In other words, not how can you use technology, uh, but where, where does, how is technology impacting the way that firms are managed, which I think is a really interesting area. We won't cover all of it in five minutes, by the way, Sebastian, in case you're a bit worried. Um, <laughs> next, we have Francesca, Francesca Lagerberg, who has been my companion on this show really for since we started the UK version, what's it, 18 months ago now. And she is the global leader of network capabilities at Grant Thornton. And she's talking about the optimal leadership styles when you're managing people. And how does that vary between managing people in Europe and managing people in North America? We then have Dar Larry Richard. Larry is Dr. Larry Richard, who is the founder and principal consultant of Lawyer Brain. Uh, and he has a psychologist, a lawyer. He has a very good understanding of what is the impact of fear and behavior, lawyer behavior on, on leadership? To what extent can leadership ignore the behavior of the fearness? I think we all kind of know the answer to that, but he's going to explore it in a bit more depth than we would perhaps normally. F finally, uh, and by no means last, uh, Larry Stroud, who is a business development coach, uh, Core Verge Inc., and he is based on what he has discovered on returning to his native Canada. And to put the thing in context, you may have read in the invitation, he has been a partner in a firm, in a council firm of Bermuda, then in the London, uh, UK, and then he went back to Canada. So this is if you like a case study, what does it really mean to be on the other side? And of course, yours truly, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Richard Chaplin, the founder and chief executive of the Managing Partners Forum. The so countercultural comparisons which are done by Hofstede look at how different countries vary according to six dimensions and I'll go through them quickly um, now I've chosen to do this on four of the countries which are on the panel as it happens because we have uh, Sebastian from Germany uh, myself and uh, Francesca from the UK uh, Larry uh, Richard from the United States and Larry Stroud from Canada. And if I say Larry during the panel session, you'll know that I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to work out how to make sure I know who, who I'm talking to. Um, but across these six dimensions, and it's something you can just, you can Google, it's, it's not complicated. Um, what you'll see is that uh, in the area of power distance, um, and there isn't very much difference that it's not high, 
In other words, we're not countries where we want to have a lot of distance between those who are ruled and those who rule. We, we're, we're, we, we don't want it to be too high. Uh, in terms of individualism, uh, and that's all about the extent to which it's an I society or it's a we society. Um, if you're going to South America, it's all vaminous. Let's go. It's a we society. Germany is more about we, whereas uh, the US is very strongly individualistic. So again, this is something that is quite important, I think, in management. Masculinity, um, that's, that's really about the extent to which um, people are driven by the process, by where they're trying to achieve rather than how they try and get there. I think that's probably one quick way of describing it. And Canada's about sort of balanced. And then the other three are all slightly more on the masculine side. In other words, this is a goal target. Let's go for it. Uncertainty of avoidance. Um, that's something which, again, I think is all about, we all know that the world is uncertain. Gosh, pandemic has been a very uncertain period for all of us. But how do you actually um, deal with that? And the lower the number, the more relaxed you are about an uncertain world, which is why probably the Brits, although we've had 130,000 deaths from COVID, a kind of which in terms of percentage of the population is pretty massive, seem to be far more relaxed than other countries like, say, New Zealand, no disrespect to Claire, uh, who are, uh, if you like, very... Um, cautious about much, much, much smaller numbers. So um, again, and I think Germany is slightly more in that um, we, we, we don't really like uh, uncertainty. We want to come up with ways to deal with it, laws, if you like. Uh, in terms of long-term orientation, this is fascinating. Um, the US is down at 26, and this is all saying we want it now. Uh, very, you know, quarterly reporting, everything that goes with that. Whereas in Germany, much more taking the longer term perspective uh, if it takes three, five years to get that, not a problem. We'll get there. It's a very, very different, I think, in its way. And uh, lastly, indulgence. Uh, and clearly, Germany is a society where indulgence uh, plays less of a role than it does in uh, the uh, the rest of uh, those other countries. So, so that's quite interesting. So what I'd like to do now is just quickly uh, encourage you to um, do our poll. Now, the poll that we're going to be asking you to do is looking at the impact of lockdown. Uh, this poll, uh, we use the polls a lot, particularly to governments, because we find that it actually has helped them in a period because uh, there's been a lot of uncertainty about what's going on. So what I'd like you to do is, and we'll be turning the poll on in a minute, is we're going to be covering a number of different questions. You, um, the general mood post lockdown. What's it like being back in the office? Uh, the extent to which you've actually uh, done stuff on your office, if you like. Uh, flexibility in working hours when you're in the office. Uh, the overall impact of lockdown. What sort of changes have there been in happiness levels, mental health levels, conflict? And, and this is always an interesting question. Do you think that there will be another lockdown imposed in the next year? Let's see what's happening. So... Uh, in terms of the first one, where are people based? 55% uh, UK, 60% Europe, and 40% uh, North America. Well, you know, we're starting somewhere. 50-50 is always the perfect, but uh, I think I'm pretty happy with that. So that's cool. Um, the next question is, is, what's the general mood at your firm towards COVID at this stage of the pandemic? And we had a really interesting conversation in one of our um sessions the other day about where were we on that journey of covid and i think the general consensus we were probably in about chapter two of five and we then said well what's the book called but we'll come on to that later maybe the panel might want to think about that in the meantime but most of you are at three in other words um it's not that it's not no one's too positive about it no one's too negative they're just kind of neutral which is fine uh, interesting, we did that question back in July and I got a much more people thinking it was positive. Uh, in terms of the mood about being in the office, 45% relaxed. Again, 14% uh, apprehensive, those numbers. I'm afraid we can't give them to you yet. I will obviously give them to you sharing, sharing between North America and uh, Europe, but uh, not unfortunately within the Zoom context, it's a little too sophisticated for Zoom. Um, in terms of have you configured your offices for social distancing, lots of people said they were going to be completely changing everything so that it was like a sort of, uh, you know, a glorified uh, canteen and everybody could come together and just chat and whatever. 60% uh, modest changes, 14% significant, 10% 
complete redesign, but only 10% said nothing. So there clearly have been some changes in terms of the office layout. In terms of flexibility of working hours, yeah, two thirds say that there has been a significantly increased flexibility of when people are in the office. Now that's not the question of how many days they come to the office, but it's more a question of when they're in the office, can they, for example, stagger their time, work flexi time, come in at different hours, et cetera. And that's sort of two thirds of saying that. Nobody, not at all, nobody. Uh, overall assessment of the impact of the pandemic. This is quite an interesting one. I'm sure the panel will have views on this. Uh, we have 40%, 41% of you who say that the overall impact, overall impact of the pandemic has been positive on their firm. Um, that's not what you might believe from the media, but that's the message we're getting from this group, obviously anonymously. 27% uh, negative, 10% too early to say. But the big, most firms on, certainly on the, on the, those on this particular show are, are people who are saying, yep, we are feeling very positive about COVID. Interesting. Um, what about happiness? What's been happening there? Yeah, well, most of you are saying that the levels of happiness during the pandemic have fallen, been a modest decrease, 55%, uh, another 10% significant decrease. Have you observed any changes during the pandemic in the proportion of people with mental health issues? And again, I deliberately turned it around. So the increase is negative, if you know. Sure, Larry has, Richard have views on that, but uh, modest increase, 60%, significant increase, 10%. So if you like, happiness has gone down, mental health issues have gone up. Uh, conflict has also gone up, uh, 20 plus percent. So there's a modest increase in that, 60% about the same. But uh, is it niggles or is it conflict? We can have a conversation around that, but it clearly has an impact. And the last one is one that uh, is quite interesting. It'll be really fascinating to pull this one out because when I asked this question for a UK audience recently, over 70% of people said they thought that uh, lockdown restrictions are likely to be reimposed in their country in the next year. And that's now dropped to 60% unlikely. So I suspect there may be even taking into account North America, I think there may well be shifts in views as to the likelihood of that particular outcome. So uh, that's enough, I think, from me in terms of uh, the poll. Thank you all very much for completing it. We will obviously get you those findings quite shortly. And I would now like to invite our first guest. And our first guest, as I think I mentioned before, is uh, Sebastian Hartman, who is the Global Head of Technology Service Strategy at KPMG, based in Frankfurt. And I've asked him to give some thoughts on, on, on the impact of technology, not, not necessarily in terms of delivering services to clients, because that's critical, but, but what is, what's it actually mean to leadership and management? How do they, how do they manage this particular technologically focused uh, ship that most of them now seem to be managing. So I'd like to hand it now over to uh, Sebastian, who's going to talk for about five minutes, and, and then we will come back and we'll have the next guest. Over to you, Sebastian. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to be on this inaugural transatlantic show. Really great. I've, I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed all the other sessions uh, that I've attended in uh, the European time zone. And um, yeah, so I think um, it's, it's not a surprise that technology has really moved to the center of attention. And I think that goes both for, for Europe and the US. Uh, I think we've all learned that we can uh, close our offices, uh, still do business, uh, but if our technology goes out, then the lights are really out. Um, so technology is not something that is for CIOs, CTOs, or uh, partners who need an excuse to, to wear a hoodie and skinny jeans and sneakers, but it's, um, it's something that is um, uh, both highly relevant to the business and the practice um, across the profession. So uh, no matter, I think we're, we're talking about legal accounting or consulting. And, um, and I think uh, a ton of surveys that are coming out these days are proving that the firms that have adopted technology more progressively, both before the pandemic or during the pandemic, have fared generally better. And um, I think the implications of that are only starting to show now. When we think about the way we deliver services, um, in the traditional sense, it is very people-based. It is 
a very, very short value chain uh, compared to other industries, right? We basically ha go, go out, we sell, uh, we listen to clients, uh, we deliver, that's where we want to spend our time, and then we end projects, matters, etc. cetera. Um, with technology in the mix, that value chain is significantly changing. It is getting much, much longer and more complex. So there's more activity upfront so that we're able to deliver. Technology needs to be configured. Uh, there's upfront investment. There is um, uh, management activities happening as we deliver services. And there's an operating tail um, when projects end or when we move into delivering uh, digital services on an ongoing basis. And I think um, the structural responses that firms need to find now are very, very interesting and will amplify some of the trends that we have seen before. Um, so I'd like to point out uh, a few of those. Uh, one is, I think, that there's a massive debate um, that's starting to emerge uh, regarding the career paths for non-traditional roles. So exactly the roles that take care of the technology that or operate at the border uh, between technology and the prof traditional professionals. And career paths for these people that are increasingly critical need to be found. And that is sometimes not easy in traditional partnership structures. And I think Europe may have had a head start in that sense with, uh, by allowing uh, different partnership structures being a bit less restrictive, for example, when it comes to law firms, uh, which is typically why the big four have, uh, for example, built much stronger legal services in Europe than they have in the US. Um, here it's easier for them to um, leverage the, the, the breadth of resources that they have coming in from, from, from other areas. But I think that is, that is about to change. Another factor that is maybe changing the picture as well, um, and doesn't really have something to do with career paths, but is um, the whole topic of cloud adoption as an underlying huge factor that uh, plays across our firms. Um, so I think cloud adoption um, has generally been slow across professional services compared with other industries. Um, now, digital transformation has accelerated uh, across industries and it's having a downstream impact on us as well. Um, maybe uh, Schrems too has put a hold on a couple of programs in, uh, in Europe or has delayed a couple of things. Fortunately, we are moving again. Um, but uh, the cloud players in general, even the large ones, I think are starting to take a different look at professional services and the role that our firms play, not just as clients for them, but also as partners in taking technology into other industries. And I think that will have uh, another impact in terms of how we operate and how we interface with our technology vendors, which again will reflect in the structures. And there, I think it will be interesting to see as more states in the US open up uh, to different law firm structures. Um, and I think it's a pretty safe bet that all the big four are keeping a very close eye on these developments, um, that, um, uh, that different um, structures will emerge for, for our firms and across our industry um, to, to actually leverage these developments. Um, when it comes to, to VC activity in technology, I think that's, that's another interesting factor that might close the gap um, between uh, Europe and the US because the US is traditionally really strong in VC activity. That's, that's getting to an all-time high, I think, um, right now. And there's some nice statistics that just came out from Crunchbase last week, I think, where we've already hit the 1 billion mark uh, this year. Uh, there's a really strong surge in M&A related deals in the legal tech space. Um, so I think um, that there's massive activity in that space that will allow um, firms to have more and better technology options uh, going forward. Um, I think that the main challenge will be how can they actually make use of these options and, um, and, and, and these emerging trends. And there again, uh, we will have this um, challenge of finding new career paths, new roles, and new partnership structures 
um, including different economic models for the firm um, to handle these developments. Uh, technology um, is something that is not just a, a rising cost position, it's something that is now driving revenue. Uh, it needs to be managed as such. Um, and people need to be put in charge um, that are capable of doing so. Um, I think the, the much larger tech industry in the US um, can be of great benefit to firms in the US. At the same time, of course, there is also there are, there are also big competition for, for this talent and um, can compensate them in a in different way and offer more attractive career paths. So I think that's, um, that's another critical element. Uh, Europe, meanwhile, I think is struggling with a similar problem. Uh, so the war for talent is definitely on. And I think it is not happening in the professional space anymore, but it's really um, driven in the technology domain and the related roles for our firms. So those are the hypotheses I would like to put out there. And I look forward to hearing more from the other panelists. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sebastian. That was really interesting. I, you mentioned the war for talent, and I remember um, somebody saying to me, uh, a wise person the other day, they said, um, the war for talent is over. Talent won. On which happy note, I would now like to introduce my second guest for today. And it's Francesca Lagerberg, who, um, as many of you will know, is the global leader for network capabilities for Grant Thornton. And uh, she is talking to us about optimal leadership styles when managing people in both Europe and North America from, I think, a unique perspective as she's dealing with leaders in both those countries and many others every day as part of her day job. Over to you, Francesca. Oh, thank you, Richard, and what a joy to be with everybody and to see some familiar faces here too. Um, covering leadership in five minutes, always a challenge. I'm going to home in on one or two things only, uh, just to amplify some of the things that are really hot topics in leadership styles as we speak. And, it, and if we were doing this not across the Atlantic, but we were doing this with some other countries, there would be some different styles and some different cultural mapping that would be hugely important of a, uh, societies who have a different approach to hierarchy and maybe have a, a, a different approach to how they like to operate in groups um, would be very, very pertinent. But North America and Europe have a lot of similarity. And often you find something that's uh, an interesting leadership development in America comes to Europe and vice versa. Probably the piece that's really been standing out and perhaps has come through as, as during the pandemic, not in spite of it, but very much during it, has been the whole concept around really being an authentic leader. Someone who's really true to who they are, really uh, comes across as someone who, what they say is who they are. They're really, they're realistic, they're practical, but they don't put on a particular leadership hat and pretend to be something that they're not. And that's been such a powerful message right throughout the COVID times where in fact some going into each other's homes almost via the laptop, by the Zoom calls, by the Teams calls has changed a lot of the dynamic. You've got to know more about people than perhaps you knew before, even when you were meeting them face to face. How many of us have been on a call and we've actually met the family and the dog and we've met the, uh, a different part of that person's life. And that has made us, I hope, become a little bit more authentic in what we do. <clears throat> There's an interesting subtext to that is that, are you comfortable with being yourself? And do you perhaps have to fake it a little bit to make it? And many people claim that they invented that concept, but the reality is that everybody does it a little bit to get themselves confident to actually open up, to be a little bit more natural. It's often quite challenging. And people do uh, sometimes find it easier to try and get that confidence by, by trying to be that to then then become it. Underpinning all of that, and I know many of you will be uh, very knowledgeable about this area, is the whole heart, uh, the whole concept of empathy as a leadership, uh, leadership way, leadership methodology, um, being a great leader, particularly during incredibly volatile and difficult times. If you can't step into the shoes of the people that you're leading, it's incredibly difficult to be a successful leader, either in America or, or in Europe. 
And empathy, of course, is very different, different to sympathy. Empathy, you're really trying to put yourself in the place of someone else. Lots of interesting research being done on that of late. Um, some of it around showing great performance results from those who truly, truly show empathic leadership. Um, it has been called the biggest single leadership skill that has come out over the last few years, but also a massive way of increasing employee retention because people really feel heard, really feel they're being understood and true action is arising from that. It can really increase leadership um, uh, success, encourage leaders to be what they want to be, but much more important, enable people to feel that they really are receiving the kind of attention, the understanding that they want. So there is a place they want to stay a part of. There's a huge amount about whether empathy can be learned. Is it something you just have? And if you haven't got it, will you ever get it? Um, it's very different to IQ, intellectual intelligence, which sometimes is just a gift that people have or they don't. You can certainly improve your emotional intelligence. And there's many ways of doing that, um, not least about really practicing some very simple techniques around listening, around making sure that you're really being alive to what's going on. There was a lovely article in the Forbes magazine recently. Uh, it's been replicated right around Europe. Uh, it's also uh, been picked up by many of the other great commentators. And I just want to share some of the thinking they had in there uh, because I think a lot of this has great traction around how you can keep on building your empathy skills. Being fully present, how many of us are on calls right now and we're actually doing our emails, we're kind of looking at something else, we're not really paying attention. When you're leading a team, not being fully present is a huge distraction. People see it and they don't think you're really listening. So fantastically helpful. Being genuinely interested, being genuinely curious in a person, it's, it's often quite difficult when there's so many things going on to actually take that time uh, to remember the simple things, you know, their birthday, their friends, their family, things that are going on in their life, and really using attentive listening, really listening to what they're saying, as opposed to just going through the motions to get to the thing you want to have to have happen. Picking up on nonverbal communication, seeing how people are responding, much harder on a laptop, much more difficult. Is someone really taking notes? Is someone really listening? Are they doing their shopping list? Are they actually doing something else? Are they shopping online? What are they doing? It, it's much easier in a room. And I think many people have really uh, struggled to read a room in the same way when it's virtual. Talking about we rather than me, hugely important as well, putting yourself very clearly in that we're in it together and really working at it. Um, nobody is a fully formed thing. There is always a way that we can keep on continuing to improve our ability to, to show compassion, to show caring, to show that we do actually care uh, about the people that we're working with. And also they, they see that that is true. You really believe it. There are so many other things I could say, Richard, uh, around this topic, but it is absolutely fascinating to see that when various uh, polls, research surveys have been done, both in America and in Europe, empathy is rising to the top of the tree on both sides of the Atlantic as a skill that a great leader needs to have. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And uh, that's, that's really um, fantastic. I think empathy is such an interesting area because, uh, um, I mean, Dan Goldman wrote about it, obviously, when he did his book on emotional intelligence. And then he spent a lot of time finding out whether he could actually measure it in practice and found that a bit of a struggle, I think, to be perfectly honest. And so um, perhaps now I'd like to invite Larry Richard, Dr. Larry Richard, who is our third guest and who is himself a psychologist and has had the chance to research and really understand the behavior of um, lawyers, I think, in particular. But I think we all agree that lawyers and accountants and other professionals exhibit many, many common characteristics. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, to Larry to, uh, to talk a little bit around um, sort of what is it that leaders need to bear in mind when managing people who exhibit these behaviours? So thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak to this group today, Richard. And I just want to say that um, this is my first opportunity to hear Francesca in a conference like this. And 
I am now suspicious that she and I may share the same brain um, because I found myself agreeing with everything that she said. And I'm actually going to talk also about empathy in a slightly different context. I've spent a large part of my career measuring the personality traits of lawyers, uh, both in the US and in other countries. I have a lot of data from Europe. <clears throat> and Richard asked us to talk about similarities and differences. And most of the story I have to tell today is about similarities. And in, in that sense, surprising similarities. Um, so I can't speak to the other professional service firms uh, as adeptly as I can about lawyers. Lawyers have certain personality traits that are atypical. So I use a, uh, a tool called the Caliper Profile. It measures 18 distinct personality traits. It's been normed for countries all over the world. It's been used in 32 different countries. And these 18 traits are normally used by everybody to a greater or lesser extent. Each trait on a scale of zero to 100 averages at the 50th percentile. And there's a range. If you take any occupation, it's not going to be exactly 50, the average for each trait for the occupation. It'll be somewhere between 40 and 60 percent. But there's one profession, which is the legal profession, that defies that standard. And seven of the 18 traits, lawyers score either below 40 on average or average score above 60. And that's just astonishing. That's seven more traits than any other occupation. So I want to talk about how these traits, especially certain of them, uh, make us similar. There are two points here. One is that we're very similar uh, between European countries and the US. And number two is that these traits are very relevant to leadership some of them. So first, to the similarities. Um, what has always struck me is while there are many differences, differences in values, differences in traditions, differences in many things between uh, people from Europe and people from the, U the US or North America, for that matter, when we look at lawyer personality traits, the seven traits I'm about to summarize for you are indistinguishable. I could not, if I looked at a profile and saw somebody's scores, I couldn't tell you what country they were from. I could tell you lawyer or not lawyer much more readily than I could tell you what country they're from. <clears throat> so what are these atypical traits? Number one, lawyers have an average skepticism score that's off the charts. In some firms, it's well over the 90th percentile, where for the public, it's always going to be 50 for each trait. Um, being skeptical is part of thinking like a lawyer, and that's what makes people with high skepticism enter this profession. Um, while we're on that subject, so law lawyers here and lawyers across the pond, very similar in their high levels of skepticism. But here's the challenge. Practicing law requires skepticism. The opposite of skepticism is trust, and the practice of leadership requires trust. In fact, Empathy is one of the components of building trust. And so it's very challenging when somebody is both a lawyer and a leader and has to vacillate between these two roles. Um, it's like having one hand in fire and the other in ice. The second trait is high autonomy. Lawyers have extraordinarily high levels of autonomy, almost as high as skepticism, in the sense that lawyers, first of all, do not want anyone telling them what to do. And secondly, lawyers, because of the nature, the structure of the practice of law, are very often uh, left to their own um, devices. No one's supervising them or breathing down their neck for the most part. They are given wide latitude in making decisions about many things. And so this attracts people with high needs for autonomy. Again, a very good thing if you want a happy career and you have high autonomy go into law. But again, when we, when we come to leadership, high autonomy is not so good because it makes us a little bit too independent uh, to create teams and a sense of we. Number three, lawyers are high in abstract reasoning. The main reason that people enter the legal profession is because they like solving problems and they like using their high levels of intelligence to feed their large brains and to stimulate them and to, uh, you know, do things that are intellectually challenging. 
um, which is fine unless you do too much of it, in which case it becomes a little bit annoying to some people. It can be devolve into analysis paralysis. And it also can lead to a lot of um, joy in arguing just for the sake of arguing. Um, lawyers in the audience right now are thinking, no, that's not right. Let me tell you why you're wrong. Um, the number four trait is urgency. Lawyers are elevated in the degree to which they want to get to the finish line. They're not patient. They're not content to be where they are now. They want to be where they're going. And so this is probably a, a trait that's attracted into this profession because the clients that lawyers serve are almost always uh, coming to lawyers because they have some very pressing problem that needs solving. And so they want their lawyers to solve it yesterday and lawyers feel that pressure. And so it doesn't uh, surprise me that people with a high dispositional sense of urgency enter a profession where that kind of urgency and, and responsiveness is required. Number six, uh, or number five rather, is low sociability. The people that enter this profession are very private and don't really prioritize relationships or intimacy. And in fact, often they devalue them or trivialize them. We often hear lawyers saying, oh, relationships, eyeball roll. Now, here we go, we're getting into touchy feely territory. And that was charming and uh, playful back in uh, you know, the 80s and the 90s. But we now have so much accumulated scientific data that social connections, authentic social connections are not only not trivial, but they rise to the top of the prediction ladder in terms of being among the most significant predictors for all of the outcomes that human beings want. Satisfying lives, satisfying workplaces, longevity, physical well-being. Social connection is a predictor for all of those things. So we're kind of misplaced to continue that uh, attitude of trivializing relationships. Number six is surprising to people who aren't in the legal profession because uh, because it's uh, something that you only see when you're up close with lawyers. And that is lawyers have the lowest score in a trait called resilience of any occupation whose data have ever been published. High resilience is somebody who in the face of criticism or rejection tolerates it well. And when it does get under their skin, a criticism, for example, they bounce back quickly. Low resilience people are very thin skinned or always defensive or often described by others as insecure. Um, they worry a lot. They feel wounded very easily. In fact, really low people, my favorite example of low, low resilience is we're walking down a street and we pass by a, a high end clothing shop. And I look in the window and I say to my lawyer colleague, look at that outfit in the window. You'd look smashing in that outfit. Well, it's a compliment, right? So most people would say, thank you. But a low resilience person says, what, you don't like what I'm wearing? So that's low, low resilience. And then the last thing is tying back to what Francesca said. There is, these six traits I've mentioned so far have always been outliers in the close to 30 years I've been measuring these traits. It's only the last three years that empathy is particularly cognitive empathy, the use of the intellect and figuring out what do you need? What's the experience you're having? How is what I'm gonna say going to land? Those kinds of empathic calculations are very important as Francesca underlined. They're important in leadership. They're important in client development and retention. They're important in collegiality. They're important in a whole bunch of things in any professional services firm. Two points. First, empathy has been dropping like a stone um, around the world. There are several studies on this. There's one major study in North America showing, uh, it's about 10 years old, but it shows that empathy among millennials has dropped 40% compared to the previous cohort, which is just an astonishing statistic. Number two is empathy is one of the most learnable personality traits. So it can be improved. Cognitive empathy in particular can be improved, but it is in my experience and from my data, very low, both here in the US and in Canada, where I've measured it, and uh, I've measured seven or eight countries in uh, Europe. 
So I turn it over to you again, Richard, and hope that uh, that's helpful to your audience. Yeah, I mean, look, it's fantastic. Thank you very, very much. I am uh, eager. Thank you. I am sort of uh, eager to uh, continue the conversation because uh, I think you're I don't say you're sort of scratching the surface, but I sense with 30 years of research, we probably just covered some of the broad traits. And I think as this show progresses, we will want to explore some of those in a bit more depth. Um, I'd now like to turn to our final uh, guest, and this is Larry Stroud. And Larry is the um, um, a business development coach, um, a native Canadian, as you will discover when he says hello, um, but had lived for many years in Bermuda. And, and in the UK as a partner in a cancer firm, two accountancy firms. So I was really thought it'd be interesting just to hear a few minutes on him and what, what was it like actually coming back home, you could call it. Over to you, sir. Because I've worked on both sides of the, in, of the Atlantic, in Europe and in North America, Richard thought I had a unique contribution to make to the transatlantic show. Um, at my old firm in the UK, I was a partner in the forensic and litigation support group, but today I'm not discussing this type of work in Canada. Um, however, in the last number of years in the UK, I was asked to become the firm's national business development and marketing partner, uh, given my success in business development in my own practice area. And when I returned to Canada, I established Corverge, my marketing and business development consulting for professional firms. So for this quick meeting, uh, what I'm gonna focus on is the first impressions I had um, on business development marketing when I returned to Canada, given my experience in the UK. Um, when returning, one of the differences I noted was that I was confronted in my target market, um, being lawyers and accountants, uh, of the general reluctance to engage consultants in the UK. Uh, but that was then. And however, now there's still uh, some reluctance within the small and mid-sized firms. This sort of ties with, uh, with what Dr. Larry just said. Uh, lawyers uh, tend to have a natural skepticism, um, and uh, this tends to be an ongoing block. Uh, for the larger firms, however, uh, they've progressively built up their in-house teams covering an array of marketing and business development functions. Um, and uh, except for a few areas, one of them being coaching for a business development. However, um, I do think that these in-house marketing specialists might come under some sort of review based upon uh, experience with the pandemic and the leadership and how they consider their work needs and how best to achieve them. Another point I, I identified when I came back to Canada um, again, this might just relate to the small to mid-sized accounting and law firm, uh, was the lack of a strategy relating to um, industry niches, unlike in the UK. Uh, I remember going into one small firm um, and uh, I asked to see the client list once they engaged me. And uh, I sat with the managing partner and identified uh, that they had five clients in the same industry area. Um, so I declared them an industry specialist. Uh, we developed an industry strategy and it was launched. Within the first year, they had doubled the number of clients uh, from that sector. They became recognized as a go-to firm. Uh, another impression I had during my time in the UK was there, there was a lack of understanding when I got back that every partner had a part to play in business development. Uh, this was not the attitude um, in the UK uh, when I left. Uh, I, might be, um, I, I might be giving the impression that, um, that professional services in Canada at the time I returned were, were not fully switched on to business development. However, I did feel that only the savvy firms and the savvy managing partners grasped the importance of investing in business development. After a few years being back, I focused my practice solely on BD coaching with lawyers and accountants, basically helping them to become better, better business developers. The coaching I'm doing uh, only relates to business development, uh, not, not life coaching. And again, um, in the UK and Europe, this type of coaching was, was widely accepted. Uh, in Canada at the time, there were very few coaches 
that focused on uh, BD. I found interestingly what Dr. Larry just said, uh, lawyers can be impatient and rightly so he said that. Uh, they want immediate results from my coaching. I have to work gently with them to celebrate their achievements, uh, their BD achievements and take it from there. But back to coaching generally, um, over time, um, in my view, and this might be a criticism, there became more uh, BD coaches uh, on the scene. Um, and again, I said, this isn't a criticism, but many of them uh, lacked the front line of experience of developing their own practices, keeping clients happy and producing results. So two other quick points I want to mention, because uh, I realized the time here. Uh, before passing back to Richard. There are, I found that there were two major differences, again, um, coming back. One of them was with the BD and marketing budgets. Uh, they were much higher in the UK than here. Um, and uh, I sense that is still likely the case. And Richard, that might be a good topic for a comparison survey. And the second point was that the, there's a differences in training and the type of training related to business development and marketing. Uh, as both a fee earner and head of marketing in the UK, um, uh, I was provided with, for example, numerous BD courses, courses on media training, personal appearance, appearance and first impressions. I was also asked uh, to chair a major conference in North America, and the firm wanted me to be do the best I could, so they hired an ex-BBC anchor man to train me over three-day periods. So that just gives you a sense of how I felt when I first got back to uh, home um, as by comparison to the UK relating to business development and marketing. So Richard, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Well, thanks very much. And uh, we've got uh, literally uh, five minutes left, which is obviously not a massive amount of time. So uh, I'd like to uh, perhaps encourage Sebastian to quickly talk. We talked a bit about career paths and uh, the extent to which they are diverging um, within the US and, and the UK? And, and what, what's your sort of general feeling around that area? I, I think my general feeling is that uh, the US traditionally had to take a different response uh, when it comes to, to some of these um, setups. Um, I think Clifford is an interesting example with Clifford Chance Applied Solutions. Um, being very separate uh, from the rest of the firm. And that's significantly changing now since earlier this year, uh, since Jerome's departure as the CEO for Clifford Chance Applied Solutions. I think in Europe, we find more integrated setups, uh, which necess isn't necessarily the easier answer uh, it, structurally and, and uh, management wise, I think. Um, and you can see that firms are obviously struggling with finding the that balance between uh, newer areas in the business, uh, how to manage them, how to run them. Um, by the way, it's also echoed uh, in the um, as a theme in the fall conference of the uh, Bucerius Law School in Germany, uh, which always has a, has a big conference in the fall. And this year they are dedicating it to the concept of ambidexterity. So the challenge of managing both the explore and the exploit parts of your business portfolio. And I think that's that's really telling uh, in, in many ways because it's exactly that challenge that um, firms are facing now, how to deal with that um, and yeah, how to run these different structures in parallel because they need to. Thanks very much. Um, I'll quickly ask uh, Dr. Larry a question and then I'll maybe come back to Francesca if I may in the last couple of minutes. But uh, Dr. Larry, you've kindly given us seven, uh, if I recall, interesting mm -hmm. areas in which there was divergence on this scale that you, that you measure. And, and I'm sure you could talk a little bit about the uh, sort of the way that lawyers operate. But how do you feel this makes lawyers react with people who are not lawyers, the, the non-people as they're sometimes referred to? Um, which is certainly a topic that I'm very passionately um, feel strongly about because I think it doesn't help if somebody else is defined as a non-person. Do, do you think that drives that behavior? 
I definitely do, Richard. The, the operative trait here is the extremely low resilience. My data show that nine out of 10 lawyers, literally nine out of 10, score on the bottom 50% of the resilience scale. It's normal for half of a population to be in the bottom half, not 90%. And that's why when you're, when you're low in resilience, you feel kind of bad about yourself. And one way of avoiding that bad feeling is to put others down so you build yourself up. And so lawyers talk about others who are not trained in the law as non-lawyers. I've never been to the doctor who told me the non-doctor will see you now. Uh, so, and the same is true for any other profession. I mean, we all have professional titles for these other ancillary roles, except in law. Fantastic. Um, move back now, if I may, to Francesca, then perhaps you'd like to just give us a few final thoughts on the, the first of these transatlantic shows, as we'll be back in a month's time with uh, Dr. Julian uh, from uh, the London Business School. Over to you, Francesca. Oh, thank you, Richard. Well, well that's fascinating, isn't it? I, I must admit, I've, um, I'm always intrigued about what makes us similar and what makes us, us different. Um, I, I'm actually a, a trained lawyer and an accountant, so I think I might need some serious therapy, actually, Dr. Larry, after, <laughs> after listening to some of that. Um, <laughs> absolutely fascinating. But also, um, there's something very encouraging about the ability to learn. There's some things you can change, and actually being aware of things and stepping into that change is hugely valuable. And, and, and something that's been touched on several times the war for talent, the, the need to get great people, keep great people and give them an environment where they want to stay, I think has permeated through everything we've talked about today. And it's going to be a trait and a factor that's going to continue right throughout all of these calls. So back to you, Richard. It's not just me. I think it's back to all of us. So uh, uh, I'd like to uh, thank our panel. I would like to thank uh, Sebastian for uh, sharing his thoughts on uh, technology and its implications. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Larry on uh, his, his very uh, incredibly deep understanding of the way lawyers work. And those who are lawyers may just think, mm, I'm not like that, but I'm sure he's going to prove to them that they are. Um, I would like to thank Larry Stroud for having kind of talked about what, what did it mean coming back home and perhaps next time we'll talk a bit more about the emotional side and what did it feel like. Um, I know the world, the world moves on, but people don't quite to the same extent. And then I'd like to thank Francesca, who has been with me for so many of these shows and I think has been uh, a fantastic uh, source of clarity around what are some of the key issues and then expressing them in, in a way that I always find fascinating. So thank you to the audience. Thank you for staying with us. Um, and uh, I look forward, hopefully, to seeing you all in five weeks time when we have uh, uh, Julian uh, from the London Business School, who's going to be talking about new forms of disruption and some other interesting presenters. So from uh, us on the Transatlantic show, and the only question I leave you with is who is on the other side? On which happy note, bye for now. <laughs>